Tommy Davis is one of the most influential people in the Nigerian and African technology community. The Nigerian-British investor, entrepreneur and philanthropist began his glittering career at IBM over three decades ago. Since then, he's helped build direct.gov.uk and the Integrated Personnel and Payroll Information System for the UK and Nigerian governments, respectively. He has also helped Lagos build its own angel investor networks while being president of the African Business Angel Network. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Davis. Tommy Davis. Tommy Davis is one of the most influential people in the Nigerian and African technology community. The Nigerian British investor, entrepreneur, and philanthropist began his glittering career at IBM over three decades ago. Since then, he's helped build direct.gov.uk and the Integrated Personnel and Payroll Information System for the UK and Nigerian governments, respectively. He has also helped Lagos build its own angel investor networks while being president of the African Business Angel Network. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Davis. I do believe we have Mr. Tommy Davis. Um, good to have you, sir, again at Art of Technology Lagos. Um, welcome to the third edition. And I know that what you're going to be speaking on will be of valuable um, a valuable contribution to the tech ecosystem. I really enjoyed your presentation last year, and I know this year will be no better, will be no different. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Isabella. Uh, I very much uh, appreciate it. Um, I've been asked to actually speak about um, equity sharing in African startups. Um, that, that was sort of the challenge I was given for this uh, particular presentation. So um, really, according to Fillory, um, nine out of 10 startups uh, fail. And if you look at CBI Insights, what they're telling us at CBI Insights is that um, one of the critical reasons for startup failure is conflict, especially when it comes to equity split arrangements. In addition, um, conflicts that happen between founders resulting in strained relationships can actually lead uh, to the startups. Uh, it can lead them down a slippery, slightly path. And I'll, uh, and I'll share one or two experiences on that note uh, with the audience as we go along. But it, it really is important that all stakeholders, including founders, are prepared okay, to manage conflict if and when they occur. What I'm hoping to spend the next few minutes on is actually answering some of the questions um, that have come through as to how should equity be shared in startups? Um, what are the important things to have in that kind of conversation? And really what exactly should people understand about vesting? Um, uh, how do you manage conflicts? And most importantly, in my opinion, how do you align your team uh, using equity to go in the direction you want the uh, startup to go? But to start, let's, let's first, let's address what exactly is startup equity? Well, it actually refers to the degree of ownership stakeholders have in the startup company. And it, it, it is about the shares um, that the founders, investors, friends, family, employees, whoever it is that they've been issued. And I'll come back to issuance in a second. This ownership, okay, is reflected in the capitalization table. Those of us in the industry call it the cap table, cap table, cap table. It's just a list of all the shares that the startup has issued and who owns them. Now, that's on the shares. The shareholding refers to the percentage of ownership each shareholder has in the startup. So I may have a thousand shares with a 4% shareholding or 250,000 shares with a 1% shareholding. Now that I've cleared that up, um, 
how do you arrive at the price? You know, how do you know what, you know, if you've got a thousand, how do you know if it's worth five Naira or two Naira or 500 Naira? That, that depends on a number of factors. Uh, first and probably the most important is the last preferred price. Okay, and that is if investors came in previously, at what price did they buy the shares at? The second is something we call post money valuation, which is simply how much was the company worth before you invested? How much did you invest? Add the two together, and that's the company's post money valuation. The hypothetical exit value, well, that you arrive at, to be honest, using comparative analysis, who else has invested in this kind of company and how much was the exit when they did it? The other factor is the number of options in a grant. And I'll talk about employee options uh, during this speech. And finally is the strike price, which is the price per share um, for exercising the options. That's, that's really how you price. Um, so now you've priced it, how do you distribute it? Well, distribution is gonna vary. Equity distribution for startups is gonna depend on first and foremost, their business model, what industry are they in? What do the founders wanna do or not wanna do? How many stakeholders are we talking about? And truth be told, there isn't a definitive, this is how it's done. But typically it's distributed among stakeholders that include the founders, their friends, their family, their fans, some say fools in the first instance, the employees, other investors like angels and VCs and advisors if they have any. Now, the important thing to note is that not all stakeholders get their shares to, you know, immediately. Um, on a, an agreement is reached that, oh, I'm gonna get this number of shares or I own this percentile. That's just an allocation. The actual distribution of shares could, you know, take as long as four or five years to get to the owners. Now, let's talk about those owners and talk about the founders first, because they're the most important. And, and that's what I've been asked to actually uh, focus on in this keto. And, you know, to determine how much should a founder get, it depends. If it's a single founder, you don't have a problem, you know, probably anything from 100% down. But once you have co-founders, um, it's an important decision I can't overstate. First and foremost, you've got to take it as early as possible. Who owns what? What do I get? What do you get? And review it as consistently and constantly as possible. Most people don't do that. The first time ah, we agreed two years ago that I own 5% and he gets so you've got to revise it. Why? Because the startup by its nature is moving fast, but I'll come to that again. But common splits we see sort of fall into different uh, allocation methods. The first is equal split. That's everybody's favorite. Oh, 50-50, 50-50, yeah. Or if there are three of you, 33, 33, if there are four of you, everybody gets 25%. That's one way. Another way is, you know, you get somebody with a senior, uh, who's a senior partner. So you bring me along uh, as a co-founder and you're probably you know, only bring a few things and yeah, in your early 30s and, you know, I'm bringing all the cash and the intellectual property, but you're going to be doing the work, then you might want to have a 60, 40, or if there are three of you, 50, 30, 20, depending on how many you have somebody who's recognized as senior, but whatever is agreed for all the founders listening out there and even the investors in them, a founder's agreement is critical. I can't overstate this. Okay, it has saved, I will tell you, free of charge, it saved me on a number of occasions, the latest being one, I will keep the name of the startup, but this is a startup out of Lagos, okay, that is currently raising $2 million, but when they started, okay, about six years ago, within two years, the founders had a brouhaha and a split, in fact, one, one founder actually left Nigeria, we have had enough, now, Guess what? If they didn't have a founder's agreement in place, we couldn't do what we did as investors, which was to bring in at their own identification, a new co-founder who took up shares and ran the company and has run it to where it is today, to where they're raising $2 million. 
So factors to consider when sharing equity between co-founders assume risk. Are you quitting your job to come and do this or do you have something else? The level of commitment, are you full-time, part-time? You know, uh, and startups by their nature are innovative. Who owns the innovation? Who's contributing to that innovation that differentiates this startup from the market? And finally, vesting schedule. And I'll, I'm gonna talk a bit more about vesting schedule uh, as we go along. Now for employees, the story is slightly different. Why? Because founders need employees. You know, this is just that simple. You can't build a great startup without having team members who build out that business operation and have expertise, capability, and experience that you just don't have. And because the budgets are typically very, very tight, you can't afford great people, uh, what has been baked into the startup uh, persona is the concept, okay, of equity as part of the compensation package. This is usually offered in two firms. There's what we call straight equity, and there's something we call options, but I'll come back to that in a second. The factors to consider when offering this, though, are very, very critical. The first is, what role is this person going to play in the, in the startup and for how long? You know, how important is that particular role in building out the startup? How senior are they? And what are the risk factors associated with them? Because what you don't want is two years in, they've collected some equity and they decide they're moving on to the next startup. And, and that's where the vesting schedule kicks in yet again. Now, as for investors, well, th this is outside, technically outside the scope of this conversation, because as you can see from the diagram on the right, you know, there are so many types of investors, you can't pigeonhole. Um, but by and large, when an investor puts money into a startup, they're taking a financial risk in the hopes of getting a financial return. And that is going to be dependent on two critical factors. One is the valuation of the startup at that point in time and the size of the uh, investment. And it's worth noting that valuation, yeah, we all talk about it. And right now, in my personal opinion, I think they're getting a bit over the top. Uh, on the continent because we're, we're awash with money, but it's never standard. It depends. It's a negotiated agreement that depends on both sides. And from an investor side, it's going to be the prevailing economic and political conditions of where that startup is operating. And that's the primary determinant of valuation. There are other factors, but trust me, that's what we're talking about. Um, as for advisors, well, increasingly we're starting to see that uh, African startups are following best practice. They're starting to bring on people who are well experienced, who have a lot of knowledge and all of capability in the industry segment, can network them, can help them build out. And to do that, you can't afford their day rates or you know their whatever rates they charge the fashion or the mechanism is to give shares. And typically, uh, not talking large amounts of shares, 1% to 5%, depending on the stage of the startup, the experience and expertise of the advisor, how much time they're going to spend with the startup and what they're going to be doing for it. And surprise, surprise, again, the vesting schedule. Okay, very, very important uh, to, to uh, bring advisors on board. So what exactly is this vesting, vesting, vesting? Well, it's a process which stakeholders in the startup, such as the co-founders and all the people I've mentioned earlier, accrue non-forfeitable rights over their share ownership in the business. That's, that's really what it is. And because it's a schedule, it defines when and how those shares that have been allocated, okay, are gonna be distributed to the stakeholder. Now, the idea is that it motivates stakeholders to make a long-term commitment so you don't have, you know, uh, walkers as we call them, and it protects against departing and everybody just walking at any time they, they choose. And also, it's worth noting that professional investors prefer vesting and will demand it, okay, 
for founders and key employees because that way they can gauge the commitment um, of the people involved in the company and protect equity from you know uh, departing uh, partners. Now, how does it work? Well, it can vary because uh, there are different agreements. The most common is what we call the graded or linear vesting. And that means allocation shares are distributed to that particular stakeholder over a fixed period of time, usually in equal portions, so that the stakeholder only receives what they've earned, okay, in time. And if they decide, oh, we're gonna terminate or I'm gonna walk, remember I talked about walkers, um, they only have what they have earned and not everything that was allocated to them. Um, cliff vesting adds a, one more dimension to a graded or linear vesting. And what it does is it puts in what we call a cooling off period uh, before the vesting scheme starts. So um, you'd have a four year vesting schedule with a one year cliff. What that means is really for the first year, nothing happens. And then after the beginning, after the first year, percentage of the allocated equity starts to vest and be distributed, could be monthly, could be quarterly, um, until it is fully vested after the four-year period. Now, I, I do, you know, in the spirit of full disclosure, there's also immediate vesting, which means, guess what? Once you sign, you get 100% ownership of the shares. That's not really uh, common in these here neck of the woods. In fact, I'm not sure where it is common, but it does exist. And you can have an acceleration of the vesting schedule and it's usually put into the agreement when there's a liquidity uh, event such as the startup being bought by another startup or it goes to IPO or something that means all the shares are off the table. And at that point, the vesting usually kicks in as vested and it is always, that's why uh, vesting is taken into consideration when we're talking about valuation. Now, I wouldn't want to uh, leave this talk without really sharing what happens over time, because it is very, very important as those who invest in, in a startup are investing, they're essentially taking a financial risk and their expectation is that you know, this financial risk over a number of years is going to re give me a financial reward. They're not expecting immediate rewards. Now, because of that, what tends to happen is what we call dilution, which decreases uh, the equity ownership by existing shareholders as new ones come in. And it can change both the financial stake founders have in the startup and how much control they have. So it's important ab initio that they understand, sorry, from the beginning that they understand, okay, exactly what that journey is and how um, it transpires. So for example, I've been seeing, you know, safes have become very, very popular. Everybody talks about a safe because it doesn't give an upfront commitment, but guess what? As people are starting to find out, it can be extremely dilutive to investors. So, uh, that's what the diagram on the front is doing is showing you on the right is doing is showing you how the dilution vehicle works over time. And you can see um, where at seed stage, a founder stake, founder stake was a 65%. By the time they get to series D, it's only a 23%. So that is what we mean by dilution. And of course, that can cause the conflicts. So how do you manage the conflicts? Well, you know, it's not like any other corporate conflict management. You just have to have a conflict management system in place. And I know most startups don't know what that is. Well, you got to look it up and be sure as you're discussing as co-founders to go on this journey, uh, you talk about it. Just like you're going to talk to a spouse about what happens if you and I disagree. Do I just say, talk to your mother or is it your brother? It's the same principles that apply because co-founding a startup is essentially a marriage or over time. So key things for founders is one, don't overestimate early value. 
most founding teams allocate founder equity right at the beginning. And they never look at it again. Not considering who did what, who does what, who brings what, as time goes on. That's why I said you've got to revisit founders' equity regularly and periodically. Okay. And you've got to include provisions to keep everyone accountable. Uh, one of the best ways to mitigate future conflict is to make sure that the agreement is actually dynamic. So it says this agreement every three years will be reviewed or you know, something to that effect, okay? And while circumstance, we can't really predict this is what's going to happen or it's going to go this way, although we try to, okay? Um, vesting, for me, is a very, very mm -hmm. critical mechanism for allaying some of those uh, fears and mitigating some of the risks as they occur. And finally, um, as I've been hinting, you really need to consider dynamic approaches, such as layering of value over time and adjusting you know, the co-founder's equity as the startup grows. Now, before I close, I just wanted to ensure that you know, we get the full picture here. Conflict between founders is something that is alive and well and living in all startups. Um, I shared the example of um, the team that was split and one, one of the founders actually left the country and we had to restructure. The critical thing to leave this audience with is first and foremost, make sure there's a founder's agreement. If there are co-founders, please put a founder's agreement in place. And in your founder's agreement, ensure you do under all circumstances, have a vesting provision with a schedule for that vesting provision. Governance, governance, governance. If you don't have a governance structure in place, then you might end up in fisticuffs for all I know. But once you've put a governance structure in place, it mitigates the risks of conflict. Why? Because you've got a mechanism for resolution and you've got a mechanism in case there's escalation. And once you've agreed it, you must think ahead. How do I justify the fact that I have 65% of this company and my co-founder only has 10%? Does that even make sense? How's it gonna make sense to investors? And what happens if my co-founder wants more and feels how, you know? So you need to think through these things and make sure that yes, you have the capability to resolve those issues. Now, as we debate and discuss these things, I think there are a few essentials that I would also want the audience to be considerate of, especially given that within our context, we're dealing with the Corporate Affairs Commission of Nigeria, nine out of 10 times. I mean, I don't know about the, I'm not speaking to those who are Delaware or Mauritius or what have you, although the same principles still hold within our environment here in Lagos and in Nigeria, we have to be conscious of the fact that there are cultural overlays to all of this. So age, for example, whether we like it or not, plays a significant difference. Gender. I've seen cap tables that were so abysmal where the woman is doing all the work and the man has 80%. How is that even possible? Oh, uh, we gave him shares because he's older than us. Why? So please, please, please. I'm not, I am not walking away from my culture, but we need to understand that who brings what value to the table. And that should be the only basis on which shares are allocated and which shareholding is earned. If we stick to those principles and we stick to the principles of transparency, integrity, and honesty, we will minimize, we're not never going to eradicate, but we will minimize conflict in startups. I hope you've all found this useful and I'd like to thank you very, very much for listening. My name is Tommy Davis and please get in touch.
at some point in time, and I'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Isabella, and very Thank much. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. I mean, you went where some people don't like to go, where people shy away from, because conflict is bound to happen, but thinking things through and paying attention to the cultural context, to gender, to the value that each person is bringing is definitely important. And I know um, quite a number of people have joined us um, online, welcome. Some of you have joined us on Zoom, we see you, welcome. I'm even seeing some comments here from Yemi Kerry, uh, from Shedunko, that's thanks for the masterclass TD. Um, from Yemi Kerry, thanks TD, always great to listen to you. Um, just like I said, I benefited last year and indeed um, I'm already thinking um, when I'm having my own startup, whenever that is not to um, value my, my startup too early because that's where the problem comes, that's um, overestimating the value and also thinking through some of the problems that may arise so that we take care of them and governance, like you mentioned, very important. Um, I, I think um, the comments here say it all. I mean, um, Dr. Prospect says, um, thank you for this opener. Um, Thank you, Ebon. That's from Oluwato Yadigite Moore, who we'll be hearing from later. Um, the thank yous are plenty. I'm sure if I read everyone's comments, we'll still be here. Um, thank you very much again. And uh, please, please let's keep the engagement going in the chat box and across our different social media platforms. It's still the art of technology, Lagos 3.0. My name is Isabella DDG. I am the host MC for today's event. I'll also be the moderator for the next panel. Speaking of which, um, the video that's about 